Thank you, Professor Eduardo uh, Yes. So I will just start. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending my thesis today. So please, please be noted that if you are using a speaker view on Zoom, um, please move your mouse cursor away from the slides so that the bottom of the slides and the top of the slides won't be covered by the two boxes. My name is Shi Bo Zhou. I work with Professor Daniel Tahu and Professor Frederick Goslin at the Laboratory for Multiscale Mechanics at Polytechnic Montreal. The goal of my PhD project is to develop multifunctional bell-inspired material that is able to absorb large amounts of kinetic energy from an impacting projectile. High strength is required for engineering materials to withstand high mechanical loads. While in many safety critical engineering systems, high toughness is also required for the material to absorb energy to resist fracture and maintain structure integrity. For example, the windshield on the aircrafts and the containment material around the turbine engine. In these applications, the material has to be tough enough to absorb a large amounts of kinetic energy either from a bird strike or from the flying turbine blades in the case of the turbine engine explosion. However, in many engineering materials, high toughness and high strength are conflated with each other. Since strong materials such as ceramic and glass, they tend to be brittle. Also, in many applications, um, multifunctionalities are also required, such as the transparency or the lightweight of the material. Those high requirements make the development of such material a great challenge in engineering. In contrast to engineering materials, biological materials achieved a great combination of high toughness and high strength with only limited material choices. Nature achieved this by constructing intricate architectures in biological materials with a variety of toughening mechanisms. A great example is the nacre material from mollusk shell. Nacre shows great uh, toughness and strength. It has a special structure called brick and mortar structure in which a microscale manual doublets are embedded in a soft proton matrix. Under mechanical loads, those manual doublets will slide on each other, dissipating energy and contributing to the toughness of nacre material, which is almost three orders of magnitude higher than the manual component itself. Researchers have successfully implemented this brick and mortar structure into engineering materials. For example, like the architected glass shown here. Under impact, the architected glass is able to absorb large amounts of kinetic energy and resist the, resist the penetration of the darts with a graceful failure. Researchers also characterized the crack growth resistance of this engineering brick and mortar structure. You can see during the crack propagation process, the crack growth resistance is actually increasing, which means that extra energy needs to be imported into the system in order for the crack to propagate furthermore. In our project, we seek to find inspirations from spider silk. As we all know, spider silk also shows great strength and toughness. The specific toughness and the strength in spider silk outperforms many engineering materials. If you look at a single false displacement curve of a, of a silk thread, the area under this loading curve represents the total energy absorbed by spider silk. And this total energy absorption consists of two components. One is the elastic components, which will be released upon unloading. The other one is the dissipated energy, that is the area between loading and unloading curve. This is the amount of the energy that is actually dissipated out of the material during the loading and the unloading process. It has been found that up to 70% of the total energy absorption in spider silk was this dissipated energy. And this high energy dissipation is especially beneficial for the spider web because it can reduce the catapulting of insects and increase the successful pre-capture. This high energy dissipation of spider silk has been found to be related with the molecular structure of spider silk. In the silk molecules, there exist large amounts of hydrogen bonds within those entangled proton chains. Under mechanical loads, those hydrogen bonds will break one by one, releasing those entangled proton chains. The breaking of sacrificial hydrogen bonds 
and the release and the unfolding of the protein chains contribute to the high extensibility and high toughness of spider silk. In our project, we, we seek to implement these sacrificial bonds and the hidden lattice toughening mechanism into engineering materials. The technology that we used to implement this mechanism is called instability-assisted 3D printing. It all starts from a very simple physical phenomenon called liquid rope cooling. Here shows a viscous thread was deposited from a certain head onto a horizontal plane. The compressive stress within the viscous thread triggers the buckling instability, causes the, the thread to coil on itself. We also found very similar coiling phenomena on our 3D printer. Here is a molten polymer thread of PLA polymer. You can see the coiling phenomenon is very similar. And what is more interesting is that when we deposit the polymer thread onto a horizontal moving platform, as you can imagine, when the, when the extruding speed of the polymer thread is equal to the moving speed of the platform, we will have straight fiber on the belt. But as we slowly decrease the moving speed of the platform, that is when the instability comes to play. We will have different patterns from meandering to the fibers with alternating loops to fibers with coiling loops. And in the end, we have fibers with overlapping coiling loops. After the cooling down of the polymer, weakly fused bonds will be produced along the fiber at the intersections. These weakly fused bonds can act as sacrificial bonds and the mechanical loading. As you can see here, upon stretching, those sacrificial bonds will break one by one, leading to the false peaks along this tensile curve. The breaking of the sacrificial bonds and the unfolding of the cooling loops contributes to extra energy absorption, which is the area under this polling curve here. This is a technology that was previously developed by my colleagues and my professors at Polytechnic Montreal. At the time that I joined this group, we had this big problem of premature failure of the fiber backbone. That is when we put several cooling loops under stretching, Sometimes we can only break one or two uh, coding loops, and then the fiber backbone breaks. This leads to very truncated force displacement curve, as you can see here. Of course, the energy absorption of this structure is much reduced. Sometimes the total energy absorption of the coding fiber is even less than the energy absorption of the straight fiber. Therefore, in my PhD project, the first objective is to understand the mechanics behind the premature failures and find effective strategies to avoid the premature failures. And the second objective is to further introduce these microstructured fibers into a elastomer composite systems. And the third objective is to demonstrate the impact absorption capabilities of the uh, composite film. For the first objective, it was necessary for me to first analyze the feeder mechanisms of those microstructured fibers and use both experimental and simulational tools to define the root cause of these premature failures, and finally give an effective strategy to avoid the premature failures and break all the sacrificial bonds. Because we can only have very limited information from a tensile test. Therefore, at the beginning of my PhD project, we developed this nonlinear quasi-static finite element analysis to simulate the breaking of the sacrificial bonds and the unfolding of the cooling loop. First, we used a linear elastic material model in the FEA. As you can see here, at the beginning of the stretching, there is a good agreement between the simulation and the tensile test. However, when a second sacrificial bond is broken, we have this difference between simulation and tensile test. Because in the simulation, the material is purely elastic. The elastic strain energy that was accumulated along this first unfolding loop will be suddenly released at the time that a new sacrificial bond is broken. This leads to a new equilibrium where the two, two cooling loops share the equal amount of deformation, which is clearly not the case in reality. Therefore, we further improved the simulation by importing the stress strain data from the tensile test of a straight fiber into the multi-linear plastic material model in the FEA. The color gradient here represents the Van Mises stress along the fiber. The red color here 
indicate large amounts of plastic deformation during the unfolding process of the loop. At the time that a new sacrificial bond is broken, the plastic strain along this first unfolding loop won't be recovered, and this gives us better agreements with the tensile test. We also compared the tensile forces from simulation and tensile test. The, the white curve here represents the tensile curve from the tensile test. In our simulation, we use a false threshold method to define when, we to, when to break the sacrificial bonds in our simulation. We always detect the pulling force in the simulation at the pulling end. Whenever the pulling force reaches the bond breaking force from the tensile test, we will break the uh, sacrificial bond in our simulation. Because the linear elastic material model overestimates the pulling force, that, that's why the uh, linear elastic FE predicts the breaking of the sacrificial bonds much earlier than the tensile test. So as you can see here, the multilinear plastic FEA shows better agreement with tensile test in terms of tensile curve and also the unfolding geometry. This reminds us the importance of plastic deformation during the unfolding process of the fiber loop. The material has to, to be able to go through large-scale plastic deformation before a new sacrificial bond can be broken. If the material is not ductile enough, the fiber backbone will just break premature, prematurely. The material, the PLA polymer that we initially used in our project, has a pretty low ductility around 5% strength. And this makes us, uh, this leads to multi uh, failure modes that we observed from tensile tests. Here, the first three failure modes are the static failures with brittle fracture. And the, from the uh, SEM image of the fracture surface, the crack initiation region of these three failure modes corresponds very well to the high tensile stress region in the simulation. We also observed a dynamic failure, that is when there are already a certain amount of sacrificial bonds broken in the system. As we already know from the simulation, during the unfolding process of the fiber loop, plastic deformation will occur. However, there still exists a certain amount of elastic deformation, and the elastic strain energy will accumulate as we break more sacrificial bonds. At the time that a new sacrificial bond is broken, those accumulated elastic energy will uh, cause a fast retraction of this new, uh, newly unfolded loop, causing the fiber to break in the middle of the loop. The final failure mode here is the actual failure. This is the failure mode that we actually prefer because after the breaking of the sacrificial bonds, the fiber is fully straightened. The fiber breaks in the middle after a significant necking. The goal here is to break more sacrificial bonds and fully straighten the fiber loop. This poses a geometrical requirements on the system in which the material has to be able to go through certain amount of deformation. Therefore, we plot those, all these failure modes against the local strain results from simulation. Here, the, the color gradient represents the actual strain along one single cooling loop. And the X axis is the unfolding percentage, which is defined as the displacement, the ratio of displacement over the hidden length. And the y-axis represents the arc length along this one single loop. As you can see, most of failure modes is actu are actually the three static brittle failures. And those failure modes, they happen around uh, an, an actual strain less than 0 0.05, which is consistent with the low ductility of PLA polymer which is around 5%. But however, you can see from the simulation results, the actual strain along the fiber loop actually can reach 0.2. After doing this, we simply switch the material from PLA to polycarbonate, which has a higher ductility up to 80% strain. Finally, we are able to break all the sacrificial bonds. And you can see here, a single fiber is even able to absorb large amounts of kinetic energy from a dropping weight. So the next question is, how can we apply this microstructure fiber in engineering bulk materials for impact absorption applications? Therefore, for the second objective, we use a silicon elastomer as the matrix material to make this uh, structure composite. 
And further, we investigated the feeder mechanism and the toughening mechanisms of this composite system. Finally, we compared the mechanical behavior of the structured composites with sacrificial bonds and the non-structured composite. The silicon elastomer that we use here is called PDMS. Because PDMS is pretty sensitive to crack. When, when there is a long crack inside the uh, specimen and they're stretching up to a critical stretching point, this pre-crack will just pr pr propagate very fast through the whole specimen. While in our composite specimen, you can see the crack propagation speed is much slower. Here, we calculated the effective energy release rate of both specimens. The energy release rate represents the amount of the energy that is released to drive the crack to propagate per unit error. Therefore, it can be interpreted as the resistance to crack, to crack growth. The white dots here represents the pure PDMS specimen. The blue dots represents our composite film. As you can see, during the crack propagation process, the pure PDMS has a pretty constant crack growth resistance, while in our composite system, the crack growth resistance is increasing during the crack propagation process. It should be noted that the, if the higher effective energy release rate in our composite material here doesn't mean that all the energy was released at the crack tip to drive the crack to propagate. Instead, most of the energy was dissipated by the breaking of the sacrificial bond and the unfolding of the cooling loops. After this pre-crack cuts through the whole specimen at the effective strength of around 0.48, the fibers are still able to carry the load. And the breaking of sacrificial bonds triggers the multiple fracture of the matrix material. And this gives us even more energy absorption under this loading curve. Next, we compared the structured composite with sacrificial bonds to the non-structured composite. And we used the total energy absorption, which is under this loading curve here, to, uh, to, to be a uh, criteria for this comparison. We make four different uh, specimens, the pure PDMS, straight fiber composite, alternating fiber composite, and hybr hybrid, com hybrid fiber composite with both straight fibers and alternating fibers. We first tested uh, the specimens without a pre-crack. The blue color represents the street fiber composite. The green color represents the alternating fiber composite. The red color represents the hybrid fiber composite. As you can see here, the alternating fiber composite shows a high extensibility, which is almost twice of the extensibility of the street fiber composite while the straight fiber composites show high stiffness and high strength. Due to the good strength hardening behavior of, our, uh, of the polycarbonate fiber here, in the straight fiber composite specimen, after the matrix crack here, the fiber is still able to carry the load until the, the, those straight fibers break one by one. And the total energy absorption of the alternating fiber uh, uh, composite is comparable uh, to the straight fiber com composites here. By combining both straight fiber and alternate fiber in the hybrid fiber composite specimen, we achieved the combination of high stiffness, high strength, and high extensibility. Next, we, we test the specimen with the pre-crack. As you can see, the white, cur the white curve represents pure PDMS. Under the presence of the pre-crack, the pure PDMS, the loading load bearing capability and the energy absorption capability are both much reduced. <coughs> While in our composite specimens, the total energy absorption still retains more than 50%. So the next question is how we can apply this composite in under transverse impact loading. Therefore, for the third objective, we further developed a bidirectional composite system with a good optical transparency for impact absorption applications. First, we further developed this uh, instability-assisted 3D printing technology to make a bidirectional two-layer fiber fabric here. The fiber pattern and the fiber separation were carefully selected so that in the first layer, the fiber loops were partially aligned. 
and the second layer, during the deposition of the second layer, the fiber, the fiber would mostly, more or less, deposited within, in between those fiber loops from the first layer. This step is critical in order to ensure that both layer, in both layers, the fiber has fully functional sacrificial bonds and hidden lenses. After the printing, we manually separated the fibers from both layers and tested them under mechanical testing. In order to have a general comparison between the mechanical behavior of both layers, we test, uh, in each test, we test three fibers from each layer. As you can see here, both the fibers from both layer have the uh, fully functional sacrificial bonds and the hidden lenses, even though the bond strength from the second layer fiber is almost 20% less than the bond strength from the first layer fibers, but the general mechanical behavior is quite similar. Next, we, inf we infiltrate the fiber fabric with a transparent elastomerizon. Because the elastomerizon here has a refractive index very close to the polycarbonate fiber, therefore you can see the fiber fabric almost disappear inside the resin. After curing, we test the optical properties of our transparent film. When a light beam crosses the test film, part of the light is re reflected, while others transmit through the material. In our composite system, the polycarbonate has a refractive index value around 1.58. We use two different elastomer resins with different refracting, refractive indexes in our test. One with a refractive index around 1.51, the other one with a refractive index around 1.55. As you can see here, the blue dots, the blue dot dashed line represents the total transmittance of the low RI elastomer resin, the pure resin. And the red dot here represents the tra total transmittance of the pure elastomer resin with a high RI. You can see the high RI elastomer shows a little bit less transmittance. This is because at the interface of the air to elastomer, this relative refractive index is higher in high RI elastomer. Therefore, it leads larger reflectance in the high RI elastomer. And therefore, uh, that's why the uh, total transmittance in the high RI elastomer is a little bit lower here. And after introducing our fiber fabric in, into the resin, this leads to more reflect, reflected interfaces between the fiber and the resin. Therefore, uh, that's why the composites, the transmittance of the composite film are all less than their uh, elastomer resin benchmark. But in general, generally, speak, generally speaking, the transmittance is pretty good, it's around 90%. And you can also see from the, the sample images here, they have pretty good trans, trans, transparency. And you may notice that the fiber fabric in the lower elastomer is more obvious, apparent, and the, the fiber fabric in the higher elastomer kind of disappear. This is related with the light diffusion. So let's look back to the uh, optical test schematic the total transmittance here includes two components. One is the diffuse components, and the other one is the specular components. Therefore, we can define the ratio of total transmit uh, of the, the ratio of the diffuse transmittance to the total transmittance as haze. We found that the haze in the high R elastomer resin is almost a half of the haze in the low R I elastomer uh, composite film. This is because that the high R elastomer has a refractive index value which is much closer to the polycarbonate fiber. Therefore, at the fiber uh, resin interface, the light refraction is smaller in the higher high R elastomer. Next, we test the impact absorption capabilities of our, of our transparent film on the falling dart impact tester. Here, we use a drop weight of more than a half a kilo, and we drop the weight from a height of 0.9 meters. This gives us an impact velocity of around 4.2 meter per second and an impact energy of around 5 joule. As you can see here, the falling dart penetrates both the pure, uh, pure, elastomer, resin, pure elastomer film and the straight fiber composite film 
but it was successfully caught by the Altentin fiber based composite film here. The spring back of the uh, falling dart enables us to measure the unloading curve on the impact force displacement curve here. As you can see, the hybrid fiber composite film shows a high stiffness and a high strength due to the um, presence of the street fiber. And we calculate with the unloading curve, we, we are able to can calculate the amount of energy that was dissipated out of the material and the amount of energy that was released upon unloading. We can define the impact of hysteresis at the ratio of the dissipated energy over the total energy absorption. We found that the impact hysteresis of our alternating fiber composite film is up to 96%. This means that up to 96% of the total absorbed impact energy was dissipated out of the material. With these results, we proved that we have successfully implemented the sacrificial bonds and the hidden lenses toughening mechanism that was found in spider silk, the molecule structures of spider silk into our microstructure fibers and further into our transparent film. We achieved the high energy dissipation behavior in our transparent film, which is similar to the energy dissipation behavior of the spider silk. To conclude, we first developed a finite element analysis to understand the premature failures and define plastic deformation as the critical point to fully release the unfolding loop and break all the sacrificial bonds. We further introduced the uh, microstructural fibers into an elastomeric composite and achieved the improvement of crack growth resistance, total energy absorption, and damage tolerance. Finally, we developed this transparent film, which is able to absorb large amounts of kinetic energy from an impacting projectile. For future work, we, we believe that our transparent film can be integrated as the polymer interlayer in laminated glasses in order to improve the energy dissipation of the laminated glasses. Considering the current progress on architected glasses, our transparent film can also be integrated in between those architected glass plates to make this uh, novel laminated glass and to further increase the energy, dissip energy dissipation of the structure. My colleague, Dr. Tsinghua Wu, also used a um, self-healing nanocomposite to fabricate the microstructure fibers with cooling loops. And she achieved this amazing self-healing behavior of the sacrificial bonds after breaking by just applying water vapors. And in the future, it would be interesting to further introduce a self-recovery behavior of the fiber loop by combining the self-healing nanocomposites with shape memory materials. Finally, it would be also interesting to print multifunctional three-dimensional architectures by our instability-assisted 3D printing technology. In the end, I would like to thank all the help and encouragement from my supervisors, Professor Frederick Goslin and Professor Daniel Tahu. They will always be my role model for the rest of my life. I also want to thank Isab the technical help from Isabel Benedict, Yannick Cambis, and Uhla. I want to especially thank all the LM2 members for their, uh, for their help, their, uh, their support, and their company during the last five years. I also want to thank the love from my families and my friends. In the end, I want to thank the foundings from FRQNT and NSERC for my PhD project. I also want to thank Matex for providing me the scholarship to do an eight-month internship in, to do an eight-month internship at Bombardi in the middle of my PhD study. Thank you. That's all for today's presentation.